Hello again. So our passage this morning comes from Esther, and man, Esther is a really hard book to pull a small, readable little passage from, it turns out. So we're going to do kind of a previously on Esther kind of thing, and I'm going to give you a little synopsis that brings us up to our passage in Esther 4 so we all know what's going on. Um, so probably many of you know the story of Esther. She was a young girl who um, was basically put into a contest to be, see who would be the next queen, and we'll get into that in more detail in a little bit. Um, so Esther wins this contest, and she becomes the queen of Persia, and in the meantime, there's this genocidal plot of the king and his right-hand man, um, Haman is his name. And so while Esther is queen, her cousin Mordecai comes to her and begs her to please go to her husband, go to the king, and tell him what's going on, tell her that she's an Israelite, tell her that she will be one of the people killed if this plan goes through and try and save the lives of all these people. So that brings us up to Esther 4, and there's this this conversation going on, and we're going to jump in right in the middle. So Esther and Mordecai are talking about this idea that Mordecai has, that she can go to the king and save her people. Um, and there's messengers, and it's all kind of covert and underground. But So we'll start in verse 10 of chapter 4. It says, Then she, Esther, instructed um, the messenger to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death, unless he extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But thirty days have passed since I have gone to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, then relief and deliverance for the Jews will arrive from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this hero of faith, Esther. And we ask that you teach us from your word this morning more about who you are and who we are as your people. And let us leave this place transformed. In your name we pray. Amen. So if you follow the news, you probably have already heard of Malala Yousafzai. I think I'm saying her last name right. She's now 16 years old, but um, when she was 14 years old, she was shot in the head by a member of the Taliban for working for education and for equal rights for the people in Pakistan. Amazingly, she survived somehow, and she's now recovered fully, and she's still speaking out for these things of justice. She's doing incredible things, and she's only 16 years old. She was nominated, I think just this last year, for a Nobel Peace Prize. She's the youngest person to ever be nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. And now she's world famous, and she has this even bigger platform to speak out against all the injustice and the horrors that are happening in Pakistan. So there's, we're going to try something today, and I don't know if it will work. <laughs> we're gonna, there's a video clip I want to show you of an interview, there she is, with Malala on um, The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. And I wish I could show you the whole interview. It's a great interview, but it's, the whole shebang is maybe 16 minutes long, so we won't do that today. I'll show you a couple of minutes. Um, so here's hoping it works, but let's, I want to hear from Malala a little bit herself. Because he spoke, out, uh, he spoke out for women's rights, he spoke out for girls' education. And at that time, I said that why shall I wait for someone else? Why shall I be looking to the government, to the army, that they would help us? <laughs> oh, <no>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's okay. If it, if it works in a couple seconds, we'll come back to it. Otherwise, I'll just tell you what she was kind of saying. You just heard her say, why should I wait for someone else? That's the key. She was 14 years old, and she could have just stayed at home. She could have just been with her friends and done things that 14-year-old girls like to do. But she decided, I need to be the voice to speak for justice. I need to be the one who acts. Why wait for someone else? Later in the, in the interview, um, Jon Stewart asked her what she, would have, what she was planning to do if someone from the Taliban came to her house, and she said, well, my first thought was I'd just hit him with a shoe. And then, 
But then she said she realized that if she did that, she would be treating them with the same cruelty that they were treating the rest of the people. And so she was willing to risk her life for the cause that she was working for. It's okay, Richard, we can just close it. Go online and look up Malala on John Stewart and you'll, you'll find it. It's a great interview. So when I heard about Malala, I, first of all, I was struck with, with the tragedy and the horror that's happening in places around the world. Um, but also, she's got such an inspiring and an encouraging story. Now here she is, this young 14-year-old girl at the time, now 16 years old, and she knew that she was willing to die for what she believed was right. She was willing to stand up. But more than that, and the little piece we got to her was probably the best, the best piece, but more than that, she wanted to be the one to speak. She didn't want to just wait for someone else, wait for someone maybe with more power or who would maybe be a little safer. She realized that she had a purpose to speak for what was right. The story of Malala reminds me so much of the story of Esther. When I was in fifth grade, I went to a Christian school and my class got to do our year-long project that year was to make, to write and cast and put on a play based on Esther. And it was really fun. We got to, we wrote all of the script ourselves, so we spent all these hours and stayed in at recess to write the script and we got to decide who would play each character. So my best friend Jenny was Esther and um, this other guy in our class was King Xerxes and I got to be the narrator, which suited me just fine because I could stand there with my paper and just tell the story. But it was, it was a really fun project, and that project gave me um, a deep love for this story. It stuck with me for my whole life, but I also think it gave me a really skewed vision of what was going on in Esther's life. I think in my fifth grade mind, I pictured Esther as a Disney princess. <laughs> you know, here was this beautiful woman who got to go into this beauty contest and meet the man of her dreams, Prince Charming, and I could picture her in the spa getting beauty treatments with cucumbers on her eyes and green mud. And, and I could picture her perfecting her talent for the beauty contest. Maybe she would sing or twirl a baton, you know, all these things. And then at the end, she is deemed most beautiful and most worthy to be queen. And I could just picture her dancing on the ballroom with her glass slipper and her big poofy dress on the arms of her Prince Charming. But that's not what the story of Esther is. It's much darker than that. It's much more like an HBO drama or an episode of Game of Thrones than a Disney princess movie. Esther's real name was Hadassah, but they changed it to Esther because the, it was more pleasing to the king, essentially. So she had a false name. When she was about 12 or 13 years old, she was drafted into the king's harem by legislature, not by choice, kind of like drafting a soldier into Vietnam when she was 12 or 13. And when she was in this harem, she was the property of the king. And this king wasn't Prince Charming. He was not a nice guy. The reason they were having this contest is because this king decided to banish his former queen because she refused to flaunt her body at a party for all his drunk friends. This is not a Disney princess story. When she was in this, this harem, she was the property of the king and she was forced to compete for the position as queen. And it wasn't a beauty pageant, there wasn't baton twirling and singing. This competition involved going to the king in his room and seeing who pleased him the most. Put it as politely as we can. <laughs> <laughs> These were 12 and 13 year old girls. And if they failed in this competition, if they lost the competition, they didn't get to go home. They didn't get to go back to their families. They went back to the harem and were told that there was a law that if the king called for them, they better go. But if they ever went without the king calling, they would be killed. This is a much, much darker story. It's full of genocide that doesn't even mention the, the plot of the king and his friend Haman who wanted to kill all of the Jews there's violence and racial tension. And once Esther was queen, her life probably didn't get a whole lot better. She was still the king's property. She was still under that law that she couldn't go see the king without, him being, without her being called or she would be put to death. She was still under a false name. She had to keep her identity as an Israelite hidden. This is not a happy story. 
You see, Esther and the Israelites were in exile. They were prisoners of war, essentially. They were displaced from their homes. They were removed from everything they knew, from their property, from their livelihoods. They were suddenly outsiders where they once were insiders. And they were struggling and trying to find any way they could to create a new life in this new place away from everything they knew with this king ruling over them. And Israel felt like God had abandoned them. Esther was facing all of these realities, and it sounds to me a lot like life under the Taliban in Pakistan for Malala. So here was Esther. She was exiled and forced into this competition. There were plots to kill all her people. She had to keep her identity a secret. You can imagine Esther was scared. You can imagine she was confused and afraid for her life. You can hear this fear in her words to Mordecai in this little snippet of the conversation we read this morning. Mordecai asked Esther to save herself and the rest of her friends and her family from this plot that's happening in the background. He asked her to use her position as queen to save all of them. And she responds in fear, citing this law, saying that if anyone goes to the king uninvited, they will be killed. I think we can all understand why she would be afraid to do that. So Mordecai reminds her that it's not just the rest of the Jews that are in danger. It's not just everyone else, but she and her family are in danger too. And then he says something incredible. He says, who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Mordecai, Mordecai says, who knows, maybe this is exactly why God put you here. So Esther followed through. She took the risk. She went to the king, and he spared her life, and she brought redemption to all of Israel. And more than that, Mordecai was honored. He was given this title and a party, and all of Israel was celebrated. In Esther 8, 16, it says, For the Jews it was a time of happiness and joy, of gladness and honor. The same day that was supposed to be a day of death, and destruction for the Israelites became a big party, a day of joy and celebrating and redemption. It reminds me so much of what Malala said in that interview, what Esther did. Malala said, why should I wait for someone else to speak up? Why should I wait for my father or the government or someone a little safer to speak up? I need to tell the world what's going on. And that's what Mordecai said to Esther. You see, God had a plan for Esther. He had a purpose for her, a high calling, and that's why he put her where he put her. Mordecai was right. God put Esther in the right place at the right time so that she could be his agent of redemption. Esther could have used her difficult circumstances as an excuse. We wouldn't have blamed her a whole lot if she did, I don't think. She could have just given up on herself, on her people, on God, and said, I'm only 12 or 13. This is too much. I'm just going to stay where I'm safe. I don't think we would have blamed her at all if that's what she had done. I mean, how often haven't we decided not to act because we were scared or confused or embarrassed about something about ourselves or our God? How often haven't we decided not to act for much less than what Esther was facing? But Esther didn't do that. Esther used her circumstances in this terrible situation. She used them to fulfill God's purposes for her. She worked this system that she was forced to be a part of to bring redemption to God's people. She rose to the occasion despite her fear and allowed God to use her. Because, just as Mordecai said, who knows? Maybe this is exactly why God put you here. John's been using this phrase the last few weeks, when everything goes wrong, the adventure begins. 
when, when everything's going right, that's not an adventure. You know, if you want a good adventure story or a good adventure movie, you want to see something where the protagonist is jumping from conflict to conflict and maybe there's a little fear even involved and they're overcoming obstacles and it's exciting. But an adventure needs conflict, right? When everything goes well, it might be rewarding or fun or you know, kind of content to sit in that situation, but that's not an adventure. In Esther's life, it probably felt like she was jumping from conflict to conflict. She probably felt like there was nothing left that could possibly go wrong, nothing left she could possibly give. But God was bringing Esther on an adventure with him. God was bringing her right where he needed her to be so that he could use her to bring salvation. We probably all know this verse from Romans 8, verse 28. Let me get to it first. It says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God works for the good of all those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. See, God's taking us on an adventure, too. And we can trust him in those adventures because we know that he works out things for our good, for those who love him. Now, that doesn't mean that the adventure will always feel fun when we're in it. It doesn't mean that if God works out all things for good, that doesn't mean that we won't feel the pain of everything going wrong. This verse in Romans isn't saying that if we just love God enough, everything will be easy and smooth sailing. That's not what it's saying. But I think this verse in Romans and the book of Esther shows us that God calls us not to hold back from life in his adventures. I think Esther shows us that we can still live in the midst of whatever's going on in our lives and that God can use us no matter what our circumstances are. The book of Esther says that we can have life and we can live out that life in love for God and all of his purposes, no matter what's happening in our own lives. God called Esther into action, calling her to build a new life for herself and for her people because of the situation she was in and because of where God had placed her. She got to be God's agent of redemption because she went on that adventure with God. God placed his chosen daughter Esther in the right place at the right time so that he could use her for something incredible. And all of this is all because of God's perfect timing. So, God's chosen ones, where has God placed you today? Maybe some of you are feeling kind of like Esther, or like Malala, that you're, you came here this morning scared or stressed or confused. Maybe you even feel like your situation is a little dangerous, maybe not quite as life-threatening as Esther, but certainly not safe. Maybe some of you came here this morning feeling sad or disappointed, or like you've been abandoned by a friend or a family member or your spouse, or by God. Maybe you feel like whatever is happening in your life or what's happened in the past has made you unusable for whatever purposes God might have had for you before. Or maybe you're on the other end of the spectrum. Maybe you came here rejoicing in new jobs, or promotions, or new friendships, or babies on the way, or other great things that God has for us. Friends, the story of Esther challenges us to always ask, no matter what situation we find ourselves in, who knows? But maybe God has put me in this position for such a time as this. Maybe this is exactly why God brought me here. Who knows? Esther remained faithful even in the midst of terrible difficulty. And God used her. She recognized God's perfect timing in her life with the help of her cousin, Mordecai. She recognized that God was at work, and so she chose to act and to follow that adventure that God was taking her on. 
So how can you remain faithful in your circumstances today, this week, this month, this year? How can you, in every situation, say to yourself and ask, who knows? Maybe I've been put in this position for such a time as this. Who knows? Let's pray. God, we thank you for these words. Um, They're challenging words, but God, we ask that you give us the courage and the boldness to follow the example of Esther. Um, Help us to be bold in going on your adventures, whatever those may hold for us. In your name we pray. Amen.